Good morning. Surely we can do better. Good morning. Make an effort. Um, welcome to chapel. Uh, this is our opportunity as a community to gather together, uh, to worship God, uh, to communicate to him uh, praise and honor and thanksgiving for all that he has done for us. Uh, in a minute, we're gonna, I'm going to pray and we're going to start in, uh, uh, with, with some musical worship. Um, and then Aaron Woods is going to speak to us. Aaron is a proud 2012 graduate of Great Lakes. He is now doing some recruiting and admissions for Emmanuel Christian Seminary. Uh, several of us here are also alum of Emmanuel. Um, and so uh, uh, he's, he's here to talk to, to students, to you guys who might be making uh, the decision, the next step decision in your preparation for ministry and, uh, and how Emmanuel might play a role in that. He's also going to share with us about the gospel and what God's doing um, in, uh, in the story that we're telling this semester of, of, of the good story of God. Um, and as we prepare for that, if you guys would bow with me, please. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather here together as your people and for us to communicate to you um, our, our praise, our, our, our prayers, uh, our worship of you. Um, we hope that what we do this morning uh, in your presence is pleasing to you. Um, and we thank you for wanting to be with us. It is in your name, in the name of your son Jesus, who is alive today, that we pray. Amen.
you guys can have a seat for a second. So um, one of the things that I remember discovering about the book of Psalms, um, maybe late in my teen years, was that there's a rich variety in there. Like I used to think it was all just praise kind of stuff, but there's all kinds of moods in it. And uh, there's these things called lament psalms, which occasionally make it into our worship, not too often. Uh, but even rarer is when we have a kind of lament that comes from somewhere other than the psalms. And that's what this next song is. Um, the title is kind of surprising, not one that you would think of from a worship song. It's called Wake Up, Jesus. And where it comes from is a story in the Gospels when uh, everybody gets in the boat, the disciples and Jesus get in the boat, and um, the storm comes, and they find that Jesus is sleeping. And so they wake him up and say, aren't you watching? Aren't you caring that we are, we're in danger of drowning here? And they're, they're crying out to Jesus. And so this song takes that idea. Um, similar language to what we see in the Psalms when we see people crying to to God and saying, are you taking note, God? Are you, are you watching? I trust in you. I know that you have rescued people before and look to me now. And this song does the same kind of thing, uh, but taking it to Jesus. And um, so in a room this size, you know, there's bound to be some of us um, who need a song of lament. At, at any given time. And so um, I think it's good for us to include this in our time of worship. And if that's, if that's not you, um, this can be a time of, of solidarity, joining in with those among us who, who may be going through something right now. sleep when we're in need just one word from the maker and all the waves will be made still just one touch from the healer and all will be made well just one
You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. Good to sort of see you all here today. Um, as uh, Brian said, uh, my name is Aaron. I'm a 2012 graduate of Great Lakes uh, Christian College, this wonderful place here. Brian said, hey, it's Ken and Barbie week. Can you come? Uh, all right, you guys are a tough crowd. We'll work on that. But I'm delighted to be with you in, in chapel uh, this, this week. Uh, I want to tell you chapel is, is a wonderful and weird place. You know, it's such an interesting time. You know, I remember sitting some through some of the best sermons I think I'd heard um, in this place, in this place, and sermons that transformed the way that I thought about the Bible, about God, about prayer, and many aspects of my life. And I also remember hearing some sermons that were not as good, maybe, um, in this place. And you never really know what you were going to get, right? Uh, you, you never know what your expectation was going to be going in. So. I hope you keep coming to chapel in, uh, with an open mind, because you never know when God is just going to show up and, and, and mess with your head or transform you. So um, that's my chapel plug. Uh, God could do something amazing right here in this place today, or it could be just another ordinary day, right? But you probably won't know until it's over. Uh, as Brian said, I am a recruiter at Emmanuel Christian Seminary. If seminary is something that you are thinking about, let's talk after this. We'll be hosting a lunch, a hibachi lunch. I'm going to take a group, so we'll meet in the back there. Brian will, tell, will remind us at the end here. And then I'll be around afterwards. If we're not able to go to lunch, um, we will try to get you back by your 1 o'clock classes. So um, I'll be around uh, in the um, back here afterwards. So today I do hope that this message is not the worst sermon you've, you'll ever hear, uh, but no guarantees. So let's get into it. I've titled my message for today, uh, Finding in the Finding of the Good News series, Hurry up and wait. There are moments of great hurry in our lives where we need to, to move to catch up to what God is doing in the world, right? And there are moments of great waiting where we have to, be, to practice patient hope and wait on God. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I want to tell you a story, that, uh, a story that changed my life. I want to tell you at least part of the gospel story, the good news story, but first, I have to tell you the story of how I heard this, uh, this gospel, this good news story, and how it was expanded here at Great Lakes. I have to tell you my story. And well, it starts with a metal band. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was, an ex I was in an experimental jazz, screamo, metalcore band 
from Portland, Michigan. Is there any Portland folk? Anybody from Portland? We got one. There are two of us. All right, sweet. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it had something to do with tight jeans, long hair. I used to have, used to have, used to have hair. Uh, a saxophone and some loud music. Our band was named Waltz of the Golden Pony, or just Waltz for short, MySpace official. Yes, it was as fun and as crazy as it sounds. We played shows all over uh, the state, from Skeletones in Grand Rapids to Max Bar here in Lansing. It was so much fun playing music with four of my closest friends. But like all good things in the world, this band came to an end, thanks to girlfriends and video games. Does anyone even play World of Warcraft anymore? Anybody? No? Okay, yeah, that game's way out. Um, because of this wild and crazy band, the Lord provided me another opportunity to play music at a more semi-professional level. At the beginning of my senior year of high school, I joined another metal band called Remembrance. Now, they're Wikipedia official. There is a Wikipedia article about them, so that's what's up. They were a little bit more serious, to say the least. They had a record out. They were signed. They had endorsements and so on. A small change in pace from the, from the Waltz band, for sure. As you know, you're, you're the senior uh, year of high school was a significant year where we let our 18-year-old selves determine the, oh, I don't know, the next few decades of our lives. So what was I going to do after high school? That was a huge question for me. College is right around the corner, and I had some decisions to make. On the band side of things, Remembrance was about to record its second record and making plans to do uh, a few small tours, possibly a tour internationally. We were going places and doing things. On the school side, in high school, I was fairly gifted in math and science, and I decided to go in into biomedical engineering. I applied to the University of Michigan. <laughs> My condolences to the state fans here. Man, that was, that was something else. Anyway, so I applied to U of M, and I was a bit surprised. Not only did I get in, but I did receive a pretty, pretty good scholarship. And that was actually pretty important to not just me, but my family. You see, neither of my parents graduated college and earnestly wanted me to take this opportunity seriously. But what about the band? My parents were both Christians and supported me in whatever I wanted to pursue. I can remember praying and asking, God, just give me wisdom. Lord, what do you want me to do? And really what I was looking for is for God to tell me exactly what I was supposed to do. Right? Anybody ever been there? Yeah. And eventually, I had a peace about staying in this band and not going to U of M. So the winter of my senior year, I deferred U of M and gave up that large scholarship to be in a metalcore band. How punk rock is that, right? <laughs> this marked a pretty big shift in my future plans. Right? I decided to pursue ministry in the band instead of pursuing engineering. I remember telling people at the time, so much safety in going off to college, right? I'm choosing to trust God with my future and pursue the band thing. But just a few months before I would graduate high school, due to unforeseen circumstances, the band <sighs> broke up. It was less about video games and girlfriends this time. I, I remember the phone call just like it was yesterday. Our guitarist, Jiffy, if anyone named Jiffy asks you to be in a band with them, always say yes. Side note. He called to let me know that him and two other members were done. They'd started playing in another band that they had felt had a better future than Remembrance. I was absolutely just crushed. All of my plans, my purpose, the sacrifices I had made, the trust I put in God, all came crashing down all at once. My future, I thought, was over. I had found myself wandering in the desert, as it were, with no next step ahead of me. I remember feeling betrayed. I gave my whole future to God, and this is what God did with it. I put my trust in his plan. I fell apart in a phone call. At this point, spring of my senior year, there was no time to figure out a new plan, right? All the colleges were already full. I had nowhere to go. It was a moment of great hurry in my life, but I did continue to pray, to seek God. I had to figure out what was next, and very quickly. And as I continued to trust God, God continued to lead me. See, I had started taking guitar lessons at this time with an old youth pastor, who introduced me to the place I would go to college, this place right here, Great Lakes Christian College. It was 20 minutes from where I grew up, but I hadn't really heard of it before. And he also offered me a youth ministry internship at a church here in Lansing, where I would eventually discern my call to teach Bible. And at Great Lakes, rather unexpectedly, it, my life was changed. It was here I learned about who God was 
in what God was doing in the world. Here, I learned to read scriptures in a way that really brought them to life. I learned that God had a place for me in his story, and that the Bible story is my story. So even though I learned so much about scripture here at Great Lakes, my life and my life was truly transformed, I still had more questions. I still felt like I needed more training. So after I graduated uh, from Great Lakes, I moved down to East Tennessee to study at a graduate school named Emmanuel Christian Seminary. And God continued to shape and form me as a Christian, a teacher, and a minister there. The Lord used this whole experience to completely transform my life, and I could never be more grateful. But I had to trust God, be patient at a time, and wait for God to direct me. And then, when he did, hurry up and catch what God was doing on the move, right? We can see that in my story, and I bet there have been moments in your life where that's been true as well. I mean, you can also see moments of great hurry and moments of great waiting in the story of Jesus and the story of Scripture. How's that for a Jesus juke for you? You guys probably didn't see that coming, right? So I want to look at the gospel story, and I want to look at two figures, Simeon and Anna, in Luke 2, 22 to 38. So go ahead and turn there if you, if you would like. But before we read that, we have to cover some ground um, to get there so we can understand why their lives show us both how to practice great waiting and great hurry. So Chapel this year has been looking at finding the good in the Bible story, and so far you've covered at least parts of the Old Testament. Last week was Restoration Appreciation Week, and before that was fall break. So it's been a minute, and you have been waiting, you've been waiting patiently for the revelation of God's work in the New Testament. You've literally been waiting for the good news. This is actually really rather well planned because you have experienced an intermission here. It's the same with the Bible. Before the New Testament story really gets going, there are 200 years of intermission. Now, here it's only been two weeks between, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament preaching, but that's, that's kind of close, right? So the intermission period is, uh, this intermission between the two, two testaments is a period we creatively call the intertestamental period. So before we read Luke, we have to set it up uh, just briefly. At the end of the Old Testament, Malachi 3 and 4, talk about the signs of the coming Messiah. What are the things that will happen before the Messiah comes? Malachi 3.1 says this, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then in the last few verses, the close of the Old Testament, before 200 years of waiting, we get this. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. And I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Okay, so we're about to enter generations of waiting. and Malachi has, has uh, given us a command and someone to look for. So what's the command? Remember the teaching of my servant Moses. And who are we looking for? Prophet Elijah. And uh, where is the Lord coming? Coming to the temple. All right. So that's about all we got before a couple hundred years of waiting. So let's look at what happens before the prophet Elijah shows up in the figure of John the Baptist. So let's go ahead and read Luke 2, 22 to 38. I've got the text here for us. So Jesus is presented at the temple. This is the, when he's a little baby. This is the, the, the front end of this. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses... They brought him, Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every first male, firstborn male should be um, designated as holy for the Lord. And they offered sacrifices according to what is said and stated in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So remember what Malachi had said, remember the teaching of my servant Moses. It's exactly what uh, the Jewish people here are doing. That's what God's people have been doing. They're patiently waiting for God's word to be fulfilled. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the conclusion, or consolation, excuse me, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. Apparently, no one told him he had to wait until Pentecost for that to happen. It had been revealed, <laughs> it's a Bible joke, it's, you know, <laughs> Uh, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided 
by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents had brought the child to Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child, you, is designated for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, in the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years until her marriage, after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they, Jesus' parents, um, returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The word of the Lord. So there's a lot here to process, and uh, I just want to bring together a few things here and offer a, a hopefully a few helpful comments. So let's look at these two characters, Anna and Simeon. Two characters in Luke, uh, two characters Luke includes in the early parts of Jesus' story, and that's it. This is the only place where they show up in the text. Two individuals who are both waiting, waiting for the appearance of the Messiah, waiting for God to work in their lives and in their world, to, and what they do in the meantime is illuminating. Let's look first at Simeon. So what does he do while during the waiting? The text does not really give us a title for Simeon, which is kind of interesting. Luke does, not say, Luke does say he was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation or the comfort of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. And that God had also promised that he would see the Messiah before he dies, the Messiah, the one who would bring about the consolation of Israel, um, which is how Isaiah and, and a lot of the sections of Isaiah talk about the restoration of Israel, this consolation, this comfort. Often in the Old Testament, comfort, consolation, restoration, and deliverance are talked about together when it describes what the, what the Messiah is doing, the one who brings about this restoration. This is part of the good news that Luke is unpacking for us. The promise that God will restore Israel is happening now in this story. And it is bigger than what we thought. Right? According to Simeon, uh, this Jesus Messiah is going to bring salvation for all people, not just for Israel. God is fulfilling the promise to Abraham given in Genesis 12. So when we, see, when we can see the gospel, the good news, it is in part that God does what he says he will do. What's interesting in this story is Simeon's hurry. He does not live in the temple like Anna does, right? Maybe he was a craftsman, someone who worked in business, or someone who traded things. Maybe he was a farmer. We just don't know. What we do know from his story is that when the Holy Spirit guided him, he moved. He made it to the temple when Jesus came, giving a powerful message about the inclusivity of the gospel. It's for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. And then we never hear from him again in the story. That's it. He waited, acted when he felt led to, and then he disappeared into history. Anna the prophet, on the other hand, she lives at the temple. She fasts and prays night and day, patiently waiting for the Messiah. Her story is one of great waiting, but also of great faithfulness during the wait, right? Remember Malachi's call to be faithful while we wait? That's Anna. And when she sees Brother Simon get hyped about a baby that's probably barely older than a month old, maybe 40 days old, it gets her attention. Could this be the one that they are waiting for? And she believes... It is. After 84 years of prayer, God was finally at work in the way that he had promised. And her role in the story is huge. She confirms what Simon sees. 
I mean, who is this Simon guy anyway? This is really interesting in, in the study. I mean, imagine if you just had this baby, you just gave birth, and you're like, okay, I got to go take him to the temple. Let's go do that. They traveled a great distance. And, uh, you know, or, or imagine if it was you, right? You take your, your child to church one day, some random old dude picks it up, and probably without washing his hands, and says, I can die now. This is salvation, right? Probably freak you out just a little bit, just a little bit. Be a little odd, right? Uh, but then the woman that you know, the faithful woman, the woman who's been here praying day and night, season after season, year after year, she says, no, hold up. Brother Simon is on to something. This one, this little child, will bring restoration. And, and this is what Anna speaks. And the word that she that is used to describe for Anna is this imperfect of elale. It describes this ongoing action. It's not something that she says one time. It's something that after this happens, she continues to bear witness to this reality. Anna continues to speak and to declare, this child is the hope that we have been waiting for. So what is this hope, this gospel that we're talking about? It is the hope for salvation, that God, beginning in the Old Testament, is going to set the world to right. And Jesus is the fulfillment of this story. Jesus says it throughout the Gospels, repent, turn to God, for the kingdom has come near. This means a whole lot of wonderful things. It means that God is going to do what he said he would do. Take care of the evil in the world, heal the broken, rescue the captives. Defeat that evil that seems to be thriving in the world. That's the good news. It is deeply personal and calls us to repent from sin and seek God's kingdom and live as the church here on earth. And it is also deeply communal. Because of this transformation, we now live as a new kind of people who give our allegiance not to a political party, not to any other person, but Jesus. And that is the good news. And I hope you find out more about that good news in your classes here, but also at your church, in your dorm, in the cafeteria, in your family, with the faculty, with your friends here. You never know when gospel conversations are going to sneak their way into your lives. In closing, I want to reflect on the hurry and the waiting that we see here in Luke. Anna waits patiently for God in the temple, and Simeon waits on God to fulfill his promise to him. The takeaway for me in this story is that their patient hope and their waiting and their hurried action when the time is right. So what does your waiting look like? Does it look like Simeon serving God in the marketplace, living the gospel before your coworkers patiently, working day in and day out, month in and month out, and being sensitive to the moving of when the Holy Spirit calls you? Sometimes we do have to hurry to catch up to what God is doing in the world, to act when called upon, to speak a word of encouragement to a coworker, or recognize the work that God is already doing in someone's life. What is your moment of hurry? Where is God moving that you need to catch up to him? Or maybe you're, you're in the moment of waiting like Anna, quietly serving God where you feel God has called you, year in and year out, but it feels like nothing is changing, and it's not leading anywhere. Well, many times God moves slower than we anticipate. I'm certain there were moments and seasons of Anna's life and ministry where she felt frustrated, maybe even resented God, right? She only got to live um, with her husband seven years before he died, and then she was stuck serving in the temple. I'm I'm sure she felt that way several times. But friends, whether you, you are in a moment of great waiting or great hurry, it feels like God is silent or absent, remember Anna. Remember Simeon. Remember Anna in her quiet and patient service in the temple. Remember God is with you in the silence, and there are many things we can do when we are waiting. How do we live lives of patient hope like Anna and Simeon in our own lives? How do we take this on? A small wisdom that I, would, that I have learned in, in how to develop patient hope like them, I think the best place to start is with gratitude. In part, I think we we have to develop thankfulness first. If we're not thankful for where we are or content in our circumstances, it's hard to be patient, isn't it? If you're struggling with patience, one step towards being more patient is to practice gratitude. If you're not sure where to start, um, try to go through your day, even today, and find things to be thankful for. 
thankful for the food that you're about to eat. Your friend, maybe just one friend, <laughs> or your family, or for your life. Don't ever take life for granted. Be grateful and content in your circumstances. Remember what and who you are hoping in, and pray that the Lord help deliver, deliver, develop, excuse me, develop patient hope in your own life. We also need to be patient and um, practice patient hope in our ministries and churches as well. Whether you are part of a church as a member or someone who is participating in the ministry of the church, we need patient hope to serve well. Because sometimes our impatience um, can harm our ministry and the people that we're serving. For those of you who are going into the ministry in the church or the marketplace, let Anna and Simeon be your models of patient hope. There will be long seasons of patient hope where we are called um, to a long obedience in the same direction as Eugene Peterson says. And may we be such a people. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, you are the God of time. All time, our time, belongs to you, O oh God. We thank you for the ways you have worked in the world before us. We thank you for the ways you have worked here in this school, in these students, in the staff, in the faculty. Thank you for the ministers you have raised up from this place, the servant leaders you have trained here and have gone into all parts of the world. We thank you for the good and patient work you have done here. Lord, help us as your people um, to be people of patient hope, to know when to wait and to know when to hurry and act. Help us to be people of patient hope. Guide us to, hope, to wait on you like Anna. And then when you move, help us be in step with your spirit like Simeon. Help us be obedient when we hear from you and when we do not. Shape us into the people of God you have called us to be in your world today. Amen. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, a couple quick announcements uh, today. Um, uh, first of all, uh, some of you guys know it's spiritual.